deformed elongate grains that define shape fabrics in rocks can be concentrated into narrow bands or shear zones. How do these form? What do they represent? Can we relate these to larger scale tectonic processes? We'll look at models for their formation and then use their structural characteristics to build kinematic interpretations. But before we look at these models, let's set up the problem. What we're worried about is the difference between isotropic rocks, those that statistically have no preferred orientation of their grain shapes, as opposed to anisotropic rocks, where there's preferred alignment of the long axes of grains. In the two photographs here, these are both the same material, both are metamorphosed gabbros. The one on the left is inferred to be undeformed, and the one on the right is inferred to be strongly deformed, creating this preferred anisotropic alignment of grains. So the intensity of the anisotropy may give an impression of increasing strain experienced by the rock. So let's look at a couple of examples in outcrop. Both of these come from the Kohistan Arc in the Pakistan Himalayas, and both are in meta-igneous rocks. And both of these views show more or less isotropic and anisotropic material. And we can pick these out using strain ellipses to represent the intensity of the shape fabric. So in both cases, we've got a gradient in the intensity of anisotropy. But in the left-hand one, we've also got that, that black layer, which gets swept out into the anisotropic zone. So we've got two things we want to think about here, the intensity of anisotropy and the behaviour of markers as they get swept into these anisotropic zones. So we want to look at models for the development of these zones of anisotropy, shear zones. We'll look at the way that fabrics develop in these shear zones and the way in which markers deflect into them as well. This outcrop in North Uist is where many of the key concepts were developed. It shows the issue where we have a narrow zone of shape fabric encased in isotropic material. And we can cartoon it up using these ellipses here. So the wall rocks are apparently undeformed and have an isotropic fabric, therefore no strain represented by the circular markers. And these change, systematically increasing in ellipticity into the centre of the shear zone and then back out of the other side. So we have a gradient in strain intensity in and out of our shear zone. Well, let's capture a strain profile and then discuss it. So here's our strain profile on the left hand side showing the strain increasing in intensity and then back out again as we cross the shear zone. We want to consider how we build these strain profiles. So we'll start with an undeformed set of markers showing circular sections in that profile there. And we're going to develop three options, three different models. Option one is so-called pure shear model which shows that the shear zone develops by compression acting perpendicular to the long axes of the ellipses. And the intensity of pure shear increases to the centre of our zone, as reflected by the ellipticity of our strain ellipses. Option two also shows a similar strain gradient, but is developed not simply through constant volume deformation in pure shear, but by volume loss. And option three is by simple shear. All of these models assume plane strain. That is, there's nothing happening in the third dimension, so we can consider the problem simply in terms of the two dimensions of the screen. Let's look at these in turn. So here's the pure shear model. Maximum compression perpendicular to the boundaries of our shear zone. And it looks like you can explain the strain gradient in that manner. But let's consider what would happen if we put adjacent columns of markers adjacent to the one that we've sketched. Well, they can't work like this because they start overlapping, in which case we have a problem of overlapping rocks. So in order to achieve 
a pattern that makes sense, we have to argue that the shear zone forms an extruding channel. OK, that's fine. All that's doing is pushing the problem to an adjacent section where we haven't drawn a column of rocks. It may work in some situations where there's somewhere for the material to extrude to, but in many situations it simply will not work because there's nowhere for the rocks to squirt to. Let's consider the second option, which was volume loss. So this doesn't generate any problems in compatibility because the column stays as our column, but there's a question about what happens to the material that's removed and what happens to the rock that remains. If a rock is made up of a collection of different mineral types, then we might expect this process to generate heterogeneous rock compositions. We can perhaps see this process here in these migmatitic rocks from the Scottish Highlands. There are pale seams running up and down the outcrop between these folds here. So perhaps in this situation, what's happened is there's been melting and we've just left some of the melt behind. So we've had volume loss in these situations. But again, this is a rather special case. So let's look at option three. This is simple shear. In this case, the wall rocks move past each other. This is the kinematic equivalent of faulting. For faulting, the strain is localised and discontinuous in the shear zone. The strain is distributed through the shear zone and is continuous. There's no break in it. So simple shear like this is the kinematic equivalent of faulting. Well, we know that faulting is a common tectonic process. So let's explore the simple shear model for shear zones. How do they develop? Well, the cartoons below show how increments of simple shear strain imposed upon an initial circular marker increases its ellipticity. Let's just consider what happens to the long axes of the ellipse. It starts off at 45 degrees and then reduces in dip. The rotation is taking that long axis down towards the orientation of a feature we call the shear plane. It's the orientation into which the shearing is occurring. With increasing strain, the ellipticity is increasing and the long axis of our ellipse rotates towards the shear plane. If we hark back to our comparison with faulting, by increasing strain, we mean if the displacement in our shear zone increases, the ellipticity increases, and this rotation increases as well. This deformation is simple shear. It's rotational and non-coaxial. To explore what that means, let's contrast it with the counter case of pure shear. Pure shear is irrotational and coaxial. Each strain increment is superposed on the other with the axes of the strain ellipse superposed one on the other. As such, pure shear distorts but doesn't generate rotation of the strain ellipse. Simple shear both distorts the ellipse and rotates it towards the shear plane. Both generate strain ellipses but they do so by different strain paths and they imply different kinematics. So, the important rule, increasing strain in shear zones increases the ellipticity of initially circular markers, therefore the intensity of a shape fabric, and it rotates the long axis of the ellipse, therefore the orientation of the shape fabric towards the shear plane. You can create this effect in a card deck by drawing a circle on the side of the cards and then shearing the cards over as shown and the circular shape you've drawn becomes elliptical. So let's show how this works using pseudo animation using this stack of circular markers. We're going to move the top to the left. So you'll see that the fabric has become more intense with greater ellipticity with each of those steps. The fabric is attempting to become parallel to the shear plane. The sides of our boxes in here have also rotated and they too are trying to become parallel to the shear plane. 
In both cases, they've still got a ways to go because we've not imposed that much displacement, that much shear strain on the system. Let's just extract the long axes of these elliptical shapes and add others to increase the length of our shear zone. And this draws out the idea that as we go from the margins into the centre of our shear zone, the fabric swings over and is becoming closer to the orientation of the shear plane. Well, let's identify some of these features using natural outcrops. So here's a very famous outcrop from Ticino in Switzerland of a granodiorite with xenoliths, and you can see across the outcrop that the intensity of the ellipticity of these objects increases. Well, we're looking at half a shear zone, so let's get half shear zone in half, and let's interpret the outcrop. We can fit ellipses to the shapes of the xenoliths in the granodiorite, and we can trace out the fabric. There we go, let's interpret. So the right hand sides move down in our view, like that. So if we look at our cartoon on our left, we can see that the long axis of the ellipses has bent into the shear zone. We can use the change in orientation of the shapes to establish the sense of movement on our shear zone. Let's go back to this example from North Uist that we started our discussions with and do the same thing. First of all, we can identify the zone of the anisotropy of the shape fabric. It's here. Now, from the wall box, let's try and trace in the fabric. Here's one trace of the shape fabric coming in. Let's draw on some others. There we go. And we can determine the sense of shear. The new foliation starts off at an angle of about 45 degrees and then swings in to the shear zone. The new fabric initiates at 45 degrees. It's too weak at that stage to be seen in the lateral outcrop. We're starting picking it up at about 30 degrees, but then it swings in to parallel to the shear zone. So the bend in gives the shear sense. So too does the bend in of a pre-existing marker. So if we look at the side of our box in here, picked out by blue, it started off perpendicular to the shearing direction, as we can see by the dashed line, and it's been deflected over to the left in and out of the shear zone. So we can use the bend in of the pre-existing marker to derive the shear sense of our shear zone. Let's do that using this example from Coastan again. Let's just grade out the shear zone and identify one of these little applied zones here. So we can see the sense of movement that the top's been deflected over to the left. Now let's mix out and see how this applique connects through the shear zone. So the bend in gives the sense of shear. This little animation also shows the analogy with faults. The shear zone is essentially a wide fault. Well, so far we've been worried about um, just looking at side onto shear zones in two dimensions. But the foliation will bend in and out of shear zones in three dimensions. Foliation is a planar or subplanar structure. So it will bend in and out, as you can see on that cartoon. On these green foliation surfaces are also sketched some circular markers that become elliptical as the foliation is stretched in and out of the shear zone. So the red arrows show the sense of displacement in our cartoon. And notice the long axes of our elliptical shapes as they go into the shear zone. There's a long axis like this, and if we look at the outcrop, it's a deformed conglomerate, and the long axes of the pebbles are stretched up and down the foliation like this. These linear features are betraying the tectonic transport direction of our shear zone, equivalent to the striations, if you like, on a fault zone. At high strain, the foliation becomes intensely developed, creating a rock called a myelinite, 
as in the photograph here. At that stage, the foliation is pretty much parallel to the shear plane. So key measurements are the intense foliation, when it becomes really intense, because that's pretty much the orientation of the shear plane, together with the stretching lineation, the long axes picked up by stretched minerals or other aggregates of minerals, and this gives us the tectonic transport direction. So those are the two key measurements to make in shear zones. So shear zones are common constituents in ductile deformed rocks. We've looked at some models of how they develop. We looked at how foliations and lineations developed in shear zones and how their orientations, together with the deflections of pre-existing markers, can be used to work out the shear sense. These discussions have dwelt on the idea that shear zones form by simple shear, primarily. Therefore, the intense foliation, when it becomes myelinitic, is pretty much parallel to the shear plane. Minerals, or aggregates of minerals, can be stretched out, and this stretching lineation betrays the tectonic transport direction for shear zones. These are important measurements to record and they allow us to take kinematics down deeper into the crust because shear zones of this type are the ductile equivalent of fault zones.